and welcome along to the MTV Rugby Pod. As ever, Alan Quinlan and Matt Williams are alongside me. Alan, um, great to have you on as well as Matt. Must have a look at last week. How disappointing was that? I know we have semi-finals to look forward to tonight and tomorrow, but we must touch on that defeat for Ireland. So close, but yet so far. Would that be fair to say, Al? Yeah, it was very close. One score in it at the end. Um, incredibly disappointing, you know, and Ireland just... Uh, we're a little bit off it and New Zealand played really well and that's not being disrespectful to New Zealand. Um, I'm, I wasn't surprised with the intensity, um, aggression and intent that they brought. Um, you know, they probably were really hurting from, from that series last last year and and obviously there's a lot on the line. You know, sometimes we, 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 we forget a little bit the pressure that they're under every time they put on um, a New Zealand jersey and and the expectation that that goes with them all the time. So, wasn't surprised with their aggression and intensity. I was just, and you know what? It's it's easy in hindsight be be um, be knowledgeable. Um, I just thought Ireland lacked that little bit of control that that um, we needed at times. Never got ahead in the scoreboard. I think that was a, a big psychological barrier for Ireland you know if they were just to get ahead they could have started managing things a little bit better box kicked you know kick tactically a bit better you know continuously trying to you know chase New Zealand and go 13 nil down early on and, and all that stuff so incredible resilience from Ireland and I think most people I know there's a few critics there and a few people who who were ready to to kind of jump and criticize Ireland not going beyond the quarter final which is legitimate we've never gone beyond it so but I just think they, they showed incredible resilience to keep fighting back, to bring it back to within a point on two occasions. Uh, they got sucker punched by New Zealand. Um, the stats will tell you Ireland had more possession, more territory, more runs, more passes, more defenders beaten, more offloads, more rucks won. Um, but, you know, less tackles. Um so, you know, the stats, sometimes it doesn't matter. Rugby is about um, being clinical at, at these moments, uh, important moments, and, and New Zealand were. I think when you look back in the balance of the game, um, and Ireland have had their fair share of luck, the bounce of the ball, and, and a lot of, you know, most of the time you kind of go, well, you create your own luck, but nothing really stuck for Ireland when, in the crucial moments, the Ronan Keller opportunity, the crossfield kick to Peter O'Mahony, the the crossfield kick for Dan Sheehan didn't set up, um, and they were up against an incredible opponent who were New Zealand, and we 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 must not forget that it's not the same New Zealand as 2011 or 2015, and some people again saying that. You know, maybe New Zealand, this is the worst New Zealand team ever. You know, the critics online and Ireland, should, you know, still went out. This New Zealand team have improved immeasurably, um, even from round one um, against France. I think their breakdown was exceptional and they're really clinical in, in their kicking game as well and where they played the game. Um, and a lot of other teams have improved. France, Ireland have improved. South Africa have been pretty... Um, on a pretty high level since since they last won the World Cup. So overall, incredibly disappointing, heartbreaking for the players. But you can't take Anton away from New Zealand. They won those little mini battles throughout the game. And uh, I just felt in commentary, you know, I didn't have a great feeling at times because I think we weren't winning those little kind of energy boosting moments. But the resilience and the heart of this team is phenomenal. And that's what makes it even worse. You know, if we were well beaten, I think you could... You could kind of, uh, I don't know, maybe in a strange way, accept it a bit better. Um, but like we were so close to possibly uh, challenging for this trophy. And, and, you know, obviously you'd have a semi final against Argentina. You'd fancy your chances a little bit there. And I think if we got to a final and, and, and didn't win that, it would have been, um, you know, hat tip to, to Ireland. But there's no fairy tales in sport. And, uh, the end, the end happened last weekend and, you know, New Zealand have that pedigree. They know how to win these big games at the right moments, given the turmoil they've had for the last two years. Matt, 13-0 down, very difficult to come back from, but they were so, so close. Did you feel sitting in the studio, Ireland would score at the end or did you think the turnover was always going to come? Were they just a wee bit too tired? 
Um, Stewie, I was in living in hope. Um, I, I'd probably add, agree with everything Alan said. I, I'd put one other. Uh, well, it's got to be a criticism. It's an observation because I don't want to criticise on because of everything Alan said. How brave were they? How and and your points too. They just kept coming back. They kept fighting. Other teams would have been beaten, and somehow they found a way to come back. You know, and, and in the end, the closeness of the game was the width of Geordie Barrett's hand. His hand under the ball when Kelleher goes over the line. That's how. That's that. In the end, there's a whole lot of other things that, that did it. That's how close the game was. For me, the the crucial point for Ireland, uh, which has been a burden, unbelievably, is the line out because the line out and the set play scrum have been such a strength under Paul O'Connell and Johnny Fogarty uh, during the during the last eighteen months. Uh, and at certain points here, as Alan and I know, and I've been telling everyone, they were they were functioning at a hundred percent success rate there. In the in the Six Nations, the line out, and you know against South Africa in the in the um, uh, in the pool games, we lost our first four and lost lost another one in the twenty two, and again on the weekend the line out was disastrous. You can't what well, they they almost did, but you if you don't have your set play sorted, you can lose one or two, but you just can't be losing the number that Ireland lost, and where they lost them, they were losing set plays. In the Kiwis 22, where where you can put some pressure on, you might just come away with three, or you might get the try, and that that to me was just the absolute um, the straw that they just couldn't couldn't overcome. It was just one factor that that would just made it impossible to overcome. But that somehow they got close. Again, let's come back to New Zealand. We're talking about Ireland. New Zealand were fantastic. I thought they upped their game immensely. Anyone who tells you this is the weakest New Zealand team ever, just just automatically turn the volume down and change channels, right? Because what they're saying is rubbish. Um, uh, you know, first of all, when anyone says ever, I don't know about you. I'm the oldest one on this panel. I certainly wasn't around to see Jackie Cole and the guys in the Second World War in the 50s and all that play. Like, how do we know? I was at the 60s. What were they like? So, like, let's not worry about that sort of rubbish. This was a great Irish team that had um, what we all knew would happen. That those quarterfinals should have been the semifinals. The quality of the opposition that the winners would play this week is significantly down. So we know that those quarterfinals, whoever won those quarterfinals was most likely going to the final. Both those quarterfinals were just epic, epic, epic matches. And unfortunately for Ireland, as I said, for me, the line out and the scrum, giving away the penalties they gave away. You know, we, there's a conversation to be had again, which I don't want to bore everyone because I'm the only one bringing it up. Why, 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 why we are allowing our matches to be determined by referees at scrum time with penalties? Uh, why we continue to do this is just, uh, to me, it's the biggest thing that's come out of the World Cup. There's a whole lot of stats that are lying. They're saying, oh, New Zealand are scoring more points from scrums than any other team, and these teams are doing this. What they won't put out and what I want to put out is what are the stats of the penalties coming from scrums? Because really, you know, some, you talk to some props and they say Porter was killing them. Other people say, no, Porter was going across. And Porter, Andrew Porter is saying, how can you penalise me when I, when I popped my opposition man? He's gone through the roof and you're penalising me. So the, the, two, the two factors that the island were giving away penalties at, at scrums, especially on their own ball, and the second point, losing their line out, against any quality team when you start doing that numbers, it makes it pretty much impossible. And unfortunately, Jordy Barrett's hand underneath the ball was the final straw. Alan, picking up from Matt there about the penalties at scrum time, which way did you see it? You know, probably isn't a conversation for today, but quickly, did you feel Ireland were a bit hard done by in there? A little bit, I think. Um it was it was pretty critical, I think, and uh, you knew, New Zealand were pretty sharp in what they were doing. Terry Lomax was, uh, you know, kind of going in at that angle as well. So you could, yeah. um, it's easy to pick out the, the loose head. Um, I'm not an expert at scrum time. I thought it was quite interesting that Alex Corbacero, the the ex England international lines player, he did some analysis on the scrum and did some videos online on Twitter and. Uh, 
and Instagram and, and was explaining them and made very valid points that um so I thought maybe they should have went fifty fifty. There was four penalties against Ireland there and um I thought there at least two of them should have been for Ireland. So mm-hmm. referees do get a pre- preconceived kind of a, um, thoughts in their heads and they'll say no, but they do. And I thought he targeted us um, uh, and reporter a little bit. Now, the first one was probably called by the assistant referee. Um, but look, they're, they're the kind of moments, you know, if you... Ireland's discipline has been excellent in the last number of years and it's been a big part of, and it is a big part of being successful that you keep the penalty count low. Um, but if you took away those penalties, Ireland give away 10 penalties in the game and, and there's four at scrum scrum time. There's a couple at the breakdown. Um, so it was significant and really it hurt Ireland a lot. So, um, you know, if they had their time back again, could they problem solve that or fix it? But again, it's really good play from New Zealand. We're uh, we're a squeaky clean team, and I think we could do with a bit of cynicism at times, particularly around the line out and gaps and spacing. I heard Wayne Barnes call on New Zealand, um, Ireland a lot of time to give the meter and the gap when it was New Zealand's throw, but I didn't really hear that at all for Ireland. Um, they've got to police that better themselves. The you know the line out. For just before Brody Retallick's try in, in Ireland's half, um, or for Ardy Sevilla's try, um, that came off a lost line out. The ball is yeah. deflected a little bit by by Caelan Doris, goes out the back. They gather at New Zealand. Uh, Will Jordan kicks a 50 22, and um, you know, Sevilla a minute later scoring a try in the corner. So they're really significant set pieces. And if you're in New Zealand going into this game, so you're trying to think. You're playing against an opposition who are full of confidence, full of self-belief, and are very dangerous when they have possession and quick possession. So what do you, what, what's the automatic thing you think of? And Matt will know this as a coach. Well, let's go after their set piece and let's physically man up against them and put pressure at the breakdown. There are kind of three key areas that are in your control. Pressure, pressure, pressure. And I thought New Zealand did that outstandingly well. And that's rugby at the top level. It's those small margins and getting in someone's face, um, counter-rocking, um, you know, winning that turnover. And Ireland just were a little bit off there. You know, at one stage, I think they got a turnover in the first half where uh, Josh van der Fleer carries the ball. He gets back up off a breakdown. We go midfield. They come back blindside. He makes a carry. And it's Jamison Gibson Park who's trying to clear out the New Zealand players. You know, we were just a little bit off there, um, and that happens. That sport when the opponent is 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 true to roof with emotion, intensity, and all that kind of stuff, and then they have that quality. They've they, that that wonderful athletic ability to hurt you. And I thought Borden Barrett was outstanding. Uh, their back three, Will Jordan and Fainga Nuku as well. You know, they were they were outstanding. We probably kicked poorly at times. There was two marks in the game where James Lowe catches one in the first half and, and Hugo Keane in the second half where they kicked downfield, they marked the ball, both players did, and they rushed it. And I don't, I just think there was no need of rushing it. If you're kicking it straight out of touch, fine. But we kicked it upfield and our players weren't even settled. And then you're, you're inviting Bowden Barrett, who's a wonderful footballer, straight back at you. And... Um, you know, his wonderful chip kick in the first half for, for that first try was, uh, you know, that's uh, you say it's a bit of luck, but it's not. You create that, and I think Ireland added to, to some of that stuff. The try from Will Jordan in the second half, for me, is the one that wins the game for them and takes the game away for Ireland because they win a four-man line out at the front of the line with Brody Retallick. It's a very wide pass, um, and that's probably the whole plan is to have a very wide pass from Aaron Smith to to get the ball to Mwanga and hopefully there's a bit of separation at the back of that four man line out and there was where you know Josh van der Fleer showed Richie Mwanga an inside shoulder which you cannot do you've got to show him an outside shoulder in that situation be just inside the defender and then you know, obviously, Dan Sheehan is covering Will Jordan and there's just that little show and go and he goes through. Even if Dan Sheehan tackled, um, went to tackle Will Jordan, it probably would have worked out better. Even if Moonga passes to Will Jordan, he goes through a clean break because 
Moonga goes clean through, and then Jordan is a support player. So it was a bit of a mess up there. And there, they, that's it. Maybe we are cursed, are we? I don't know. Um, <laughs> because, uh, you know, this team have been incredible. And you know what? They deserve some criticism because they've lost the game. And I know there's teams in other countries who are very envious of Ireland's run. There's a lot of Scottish people come into my timeline online. There's a lot of Welsh people. Um, less so English people for some reason. I don't know. But Wales and Scotland are, are you know, quite slow to give praise to this Irish team and the run they've been on, particularly online, not their coaches and players and, and rugby people and such, journalists and stuff like that. They've all been very, very complimentary of them. But, um, you know, they've they've lost a big quarter final and, and we can't get away from that fact. Um, there's a lot of players will move on. There's a lot of players will be too old for the next World Cup. Uh, but I think, look, at the end of the day, You've got to dust yourself down and move on, and they've got to go back to their provinces. And I think the exciting part here will be uh, the rebuild from Andy Farrell and his coaches. And I think that's we should be excited by that. It was a week ago, Gregor Townsend was saying the systems in Ireland, the structures, Ireland could dominate for the next five years um, with, the, with their systems. So we're the envy of a lot of teams with the structures here in Ireland. We have a, a small playing pool. Let's not get away from that. GA and soccer are bigger than rugby in Ireland. Um, and a lot of the negative comments, the minority of the negative comments come from people from those quarters because they think rugby gets too much coverage and it's hyped up too much and the press play a part in that. Anything that was on the press leading up to this World Cup was legitimate. And, you know, we were entitled to be a bit excited. I was very optimistic because we got... Um, I think 2019 was, you know, a bit of a real eye-opener. This team, I don't think, failed. I think, uh, in a sense, that for me, the idea of, of, of a failure or a loser is someone who doesn't put their body on the line and doesn't kind of throw, throw everything at us. And I think this team did. We should be very proud of them. Um, the reality is, um, and I, I, I found it quite interesting that Johnny Sexton said, well, you know, when I was growing up, I didn't dream about winning a World Cup because it wasn't in our psyche. And, you know, if you ask anyone in my era growing up, you know, who are the top nations? You go, New Zealand, South Africa, Australia. They're the big ones. England, uh, playing numbers, power, strength, and history behind them as regards being, being winners of competitions. Um, so this team put themselves in a position that gave kind of genuine hope. And on the day, just things didn't quite click into place. And they still could have won the game. You know, you saw the reaction from the New Zealand players at the end. A lot of ex-New Zealand players saying this is their best performance in four years. Not in two years, but four years. Yeah. So it shows that um, they respected Ireland too much this time. And, you know, respect is about understanding the dangers and the quality of the opposition as well. It's obviously about, you know, your actions and the way you behave and talk about people and and, and how you conduct yourself. But also, like, I think New Zealand of old would have not really kind of paid so much attention to Ireland. But for me, there's a lot of Joe Schmidt in this that victory as well because uh, the breakdown was superb. Their organisation, their shape, their attack looked so much better than 14, 15 months ago in the summer series. Not, not only did Ireland beat them, if we remember, Argentina beat them at the end of August in 2020-22 in Christchurch. So Aaron Smith said it during the week. They've come on a lot and uh, they were right. And, and again, sometimes it's players speak, isn't it? Oh, we've improved. We got better. We've learned the lessons. But repetitive training and, and again, as a coach, Matt knows this. There's nothing. They didn't bring anything scientific on Saturday night. They got their basics unbelievably right. They brought their physicality and they brought accuracy around the breakdown. And... We've all played in matches or been involved in matches where you have a bad day at the office at the breakdown in a league match. You get out Monday morning, you rip into each other and you get the pads out and you get all this technique and you do an hour and a half of rocking and it's like chalk and cheese the following Saturday. New Zealand had that repetitive nature around where, where they were weak and where they, things had let them down and they got that right. So they deserve the credit. Ireland are gone and... Uh, but, you know, you've got to think, what's the rebuild going to be like now? And that's the, the exciting part. And um, 
hopefully lots of young players can come through. We have a very good under-20 team in the summer and uh, bring a handful of through and, and hopefully we'll see them at the next World Cup. And, uh, you know, finally we'll win a World Cup in Australia in 2027, Matt. Back in Sydney, we can have a glass of wine there. <laughs> We can we're only hope well, somewhere in that answer, Alan said, maybe we are cursed. <laughs> if we a final touch on you, Matt, you know, the rebuild and stuff. But Andy Farrell so far, he's done such a great job. But what will he be thinking right now outside of the obvious hurt? You know, he'll take a couple of weeks. But where do you feel Ireland needed? You know, is it literally the top couple inches or just a, a final? Because we've got to touch on the other quarter final and the semi finals. But what will Andy Farrell be thinking right now? Well, he, his question is where did that, where did those failures come from in that game that weren't there for 18 months? And Alan touched on it and he's 100% correct. Will Jordan's try, and that was a beautiful long pass, nine to 10, and no one tackles the 10. <laughs> like if you're under 15s, do that. You're going, boys, come on, who's got 10? That's the first thing you say. Who's got 10? Who's got the winger on the inside? It was hardly, you know, an unbelievably creative move. So where did that miss come from? Where did where did the line-out performance come from? Where did the scrum performance come from? And as Alan said, why were we a, a, a half a second late on far too many rucks so we lose them? So that's what's, that's what's in his mind. And I hate to say this, they're going to have to go as simply as saying, what was our selection policy coming into the tournament? Did this team, and I'm sorry, I don't want to criticise, but it's an observation. Did this team go to the well too many times in a row before the quarterfinal? So this team roughly played the entire tournament. Was that the right policy? Should they have not selected this team for the first game against Romania or the second game against Tonga, was playing the five games, even though we had a break between South Africa and Scotland, was it too much? Now, somewhere in that question is the answer why we're not in a, a semi. The second part of that is the next draw, if Ireland play as well as they do, they will be in a semi because they won't have the top four teams on one side of the pool. So the draw, that we've, got to, we've got to be real here, and all the begrudges out there that want to put the, this national team down, you know, I, I don't listen to them. You know, you don't listen to pettiness. This is a great side. They've done great things. They equal, you know, teams, test matches, teams don't win 20 test matches in a row for a reason. It's bloody hard. You know, no one's done it ever in history. Why? Because it's really, 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 really hard. So let, let's put the begrudges to one side. Somewhere in those questions, Andy Farrell's going to have some answers. I, I'm not concerned about the rebuild for all of the reasons Alan said. They've got a great structure, great young players coming through. But those challenges at the top 1% of the game are going to remain. Winning World Cups is really, really hard. You've got to get everything right. And if you don't quite get your selections right, don't quite get your rest right, get your recovery right, you don't quite, just an inch, you'll fail. Now, here's the question. Here's, here's the next question on that. New Zealand and South Africa busted themselves to win those games. Absolutely busted themselves to win those games. Two of the greatest games we'll ever see. How much have they got left for this week in the final? So the winner, the winner will get those questions that I just asked about Ireland right. How will they get their recovery right? How will they go? Can you keep going to the well as hard and as emotionally as they did last week? The answer is no. So World Cups are littered with teams that have heroic performances one week and fail the next because they're just exhausted. They haven't recovered. So the teams that get those questions right, they win, the, they win the World Cup. That's as simple as that. So that's where I think Andy will be. But no one should be – we're disappointed and we've got to point those things out like we have. But uh, if you're not proud of that team, you're not being fair. They, were, they gave everything they had. They tried their guts out. They were beaten four or five times. They found a way to come back despite all the things that went wrong. We should be really, really proud of them. And I know it's not going to help those boys. Those boys are going to be hurting for a long, long time.
but they should be proud of it too. They got the, you couldn't ask anything more of that side. Physically, as as Alan said, physically, they they did. There was nothing left. They gave it everything they had, and on the day you weren't good enough. And unfortunately, in sport, you got to stick your chin out and cop it and go on to the next week. Yeah, they did certainly give everything they've got. Al, um, the other quarterfinal, France South Africa, best game you've ever seen, or is that too big a statement? How good know, just was it? Every every part of it. Yeah, the 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 intensity of that game was phenomenal. It was uh, there were two brilliant games. I think um, I thought they'd cancel each other out a little bit on on Sunday night, and uh, to be a bit of an arm wrestle and and slugfest. And but the pace and tempo of the game was was exceptional. And um, you know, for South Africa to go into that arena, um, you know, we think we're bad a little bit on on, on uh, Sunday morning, dusting ourselves off after the Irish loss and the dis- disappointment to that. But, you know, I was in Paris still on Monday morning and uh, it was like a national disaster there with what had happened to them. Um, yeah, so it was, it was an incredible game. I think uh, Razi and Jack Nienenberg, they seemed to get it right. They targeted out around that 13 channel, between thir- the 13 channel and wing with those cross field high kicks. And they got two tries in the first half from them. Um you know, I think neither side overplayed too much as regards because they were very conscious of the breakdown pressure that that each of them could put on. But um, you know, South Africa uh, to manage that emotion and 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 intensity, the crowd and all that kind of expectation with France, and to go into that cauldron and and look really comfortable and and not panic at any stage, I think was very very impressive, and it shows the mentality they're at, and probably. One last point in Ireland, I think part of the rebuild for me is trying to get to a point where well, how good would it be as a coach to be able to make the changes that Rassi Erasmus can make? And probably from 24 to 32 in their squad, um, you could land those eight players into the South African starting team and, and there's not a huge difference. We don't have that depth, um, and it's probably one of the reasons why all these changes didn't happen. It was a roll of the dice, but once you go down the, you know, from the top 15, 16, maybe 17, 18 players of Ireland, there is a difference, and that's the reality. Um, from an experience point of view, from um, a quality point of view, um, and that's probably the challenge for Ireland in, in rebuilding. But for South Africa, and 44 minutes to be taken off your captain and bringing on you know, Quagga Smith and R.G. Snyman and um, Dion Ferry and fellas like that, Faf de Klerk, um, Andre Pollard. Wow, it's incredible, isn't it? Um, and they just look comfortable. They look like they have a real battle-hardened mentality. And, um, you know, their game has evolved from 2019. They've, they've so much variation. They can play many different ways. Um, and and Cole Scrum's amazing... off a of mark, Al. Yeah, well, that's down the kicks of Colby, it? but how good's that mentality? Like as you said, yeah, it is, and it's uh, you know if if uh, friends can get you, a can you see there... teams doing that going forward, Al? Is that just no, our pack's no. unbelievable? No, like, well, <laughs> if you're if you're the South African forwards, yes, um, but no, I can't. Um, most teams there would say we got the mark, kick the ball down the touch line, put it into touch in their half of the field, let them have the line out, and let them work their way back up again so no but it, that, that's South Africa for France I thought some of the rugby and the response at times you know France conceded you would have to say two tries that were or the preventable mass you know with those high kicks should they have done better you know yeah. the French sure. like Waki goes up for one ball he's all over the shop the ball bounces up uh, to Damien Dialinda and Peter Steph the toy he sco- ends up scoring a try the Aronsa one is a little bit unlucky it can happen, but the kick goes there, and Aronsa has that in his head. I'm gonna ready to gather anything up. So France would probably look back and say a little bit like Ireland, some issues and regrets about mistakes they made. Um, and uh, you know, it's it was what what a game it was. It was just incredible. Cheslin Colby charging down the kick, it, and it proved to be really significant. Ramos doesn't really miss. Um, so it was an amazing game, great intensity, and and again, it's a shame in the sense that we saw 
two wonderful quarterfinals when that should have been at least um, semi-final final stage or maybe in the final, you know, to see a game like that. But we still most probably have, um, I know Michael Checker might, might be happy with me saying this, or Steve Borthwick, the expectation is it's going to be New Zealand South Africa final, and you know that what a that have been incredible contests. But um, what a game the last two weekend. And look, if you look at the other games as well, Stuart, I think they were great games as well. So they were different level. But uh, Wales Argentina was great excitement. England Fiji really exciting right up to the end as well. Not the same type of intensity or quality, but there were still four great games. Matt, just the last one on South Africa, France. You know, we take the charge down incident and we look at Kobe coming out, you know, of the huddle. And he did it the first time, didn't quite work. But the second time to do it with Ramos, obviously his club teammate, he just knows him so well. But as a coach, you know, that's exactly what you want the players doing to say the obvious. But it's a big pat on the back for him. And like at the end of the get, at the end of the day, those two points were absolutely massive in the result and really affected the outcome. Absolutely, Stu. Absolutely, um, and you got to say that Colby has, you know, planned that. And what, what I mean by that, they've studied the video. They said, "How long? When can I go? When can I move? How many seconds have I got till he kicks the ball?" I mean, this is the detail that everyone goes into, and he's worked out. Okay, I reckon I can get that distance. I mean, Colby is just electric. Um, I can't remember ever seeing that at test match level. I, I, I certainly, I've probably seen it at provincial level back in Australia and New Zealand, but a long time ago, but I don't think I've ever seen that at a test match. Um, and it was crucial. The games, uh, like Alan said, both those games had something in common as in the Irish New Zealand game, the South Africa France game, in that the losing team conceded far too many soft points. And you just, you just can't do that. So the first three South African tries, and I think I texted you, Stu, um, I went through them yesterday. Uh, I counted three passes for three tries. So kick, nine to ten kick across field, try. Ruthless, ruthless. Nine to ten kick across field, one pass, because uh, Delonde was tackled and, and uh, the, the, the uh, sorry, it was, it was tackled and there's one pass and a try. And then the other one is a French turnover one pass to Jesse Creel who kicks through and, try, and scores a try. So you're conceding 21 points in the opposition to put together three passes. You just can't hope to do that. Having said all that, I have to mention this. Justice was not done. <laughs> I'm sorry. The last penalty was not a penalty. It was a penalty the other way. And I am I am not criticising criticizing the referee, right? And... Um, he, Sorry, Matt, he, why are you just saying that he's not supporting his body weight? Oh, his hand was on the ground first. That's a penalty to France. It's just, it was his blatant penalty to France, right? Quinny might have done that back in the day, I'd say. Well, you could, it's there now. Quinny did it a lot, but you could do it. You were allowed to do it. Now it's illegal. Which, you know, and there's so many penalties that can be given at a breakdown. Uh, Robbie Carney was saying to me, he reckons there's 19 penalties can be awarded at every breakdown. Now, I don't know if that's factual, but there's a lot. So I'm not criticising Ben O'Keefe. And Ben O'Keefe has got awful, awful treatment um, and abuse that should not occur to any official. And I'm not, my, my point is not against referee O'Keefe because, you know, there was that many decisions he had to make and so many things. And the referees do get it wrong. But we now have the technology to get that right. We now have the technology. So the TMO, if someone comes in on a neck roll, TMO comes in and says, Ben, there's a neck roll, come back to that. TMO, should cut. we've got to give them the ability to come and say, we've just seen a replay and that it's wrong. Change. Because if your game is not just, now we're going to have human error everywhere, but if you don't have justice, it's really hard on the game. It's really hard for everyone in the game. And justice was not delivered there. Now, the point I'm making is we have the ability to deliver justice. We need to support our officials with more technology and give the referees, the chance to make good their mistakes because we all make mistakes. I couldn't referee that game. No one get because these guys are so good at what they do and it's so difficult. But let's support them because in the end, that shouldn't have been a penalty and it shouldn't have been three points. And that's a to, the fact that we've got to talk about that again at a World Cup is really bad for our game. 
Again, not one bit of criticism for referee O'Keefe. I, uh, I really feel for him in this situation. The system is letting us down, but the system could easily be fixed. And we need world rugby to act faster than what they are. You know, they're a monolith. They are so slow in the changes that we need to bring in because that, that, that was so sad. It was a great game. It was a magnificent game of rugby, pulsating. You couldn't take your eyes off it. It was phenomenally exciting, and we certainly didn't need that at the end of the game. Now, in Ireland, I'm in France, talking to you from France. I've got to tell you, it has been massive over here, absolutely massive on the refereeing performance. Um, and a whole lot of allegations have come out through former players from the 1995 World Cup uh, about uh, allegations of, of uh, officials getting it wrong and the whole, I'm, I'm, it has really, really hit the hit the, um, the 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 front pages, literally over here, of what was out been alleged to have happened. So the fact that we've got our officials um, not being supported by the technology that's available to get the decisions right, I think is really bad for our game. And it's a, it is such a shame that I have to we, we do have to talk about it because it happened, but it's such a shame that we're doing that because it was a phenomenal game of rugby. The fine margins of rugby. Alan, we must move on to the semi-finals. First one takes tonight, takes place in Paris, Argentina against New Zealand. Argentina's third semi-final in five World Cups. Do you give them any chance at all, even with a Cheka master plan, or will they just not be good enough? New Zealand make a few changes of themselves, obviously, with Whitelock and Mark Talea coming in. Um, yeah, Argentina have a chance, um, definitely. I think New Zealand... It's it's a big turnaround. Both teams six days. Um, how much toll would that Irish game have had on New Zealand? Um, the emotional high of that, and Steve Hansen or Steve, Ian Foster has said it. Sorry, um, that's the challenge this week is 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 getting back down to earth and and not taking all the pats and bat on the back and getting carried away because. Um, there's one opponent that's, that has a great ability to get in your face and frustrate you and they have some great quality as well. We haven't really seen it, uh, which was um, unexpected because we all thought that Argentina would probably beat England in that open game and I thought they were real dark horses and a chance. But they're in a semi-final, so they've got to a semi-final now and, and um, they certainly won't. New Zealand are going to have to be sharp and 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 pretty on the money to to make sure that Argentina don't mess them up, frustrate them, and um, they're dangerous. I think on the balance of probabilities, it's a New Zealand win, and that'll suit Michael Cech and the Argentinians. But we know how passionate they are; it's incredible. Uh, and if they get any sniff um, or any chance of of uh, messing New Zealand up. They'll be all over them, you know. So um, it's 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 going to be a, a a tricky game for them. But I think you would kind of say that where New Zealand are at now, they're a different team than than the opening game. I think their their ac accuracy and execution. So they've got to build on that, and you know that's the challenge for them this week. Um, Argentina were very slow starters in this competition. The England really kind of. Uh, blew them away with a simple, boring, bland type of performance. Drop three drop goals, lots of penalties from George Ford. He was brilliant. Um, but they only played one warm up game against Spain. I couldn't believe it. You talk about build ups to a World Cup and getting matches under your belt and cohesion. They played Spain in a game. That was it. So I think they've gradually got better. They were poor against Samoa, much better against Japan. I think at times on Saturday, Wales looked like they were going to kick on and, and um, were in control of that game. Their Argentina's second half was so much better and they're a dangerous side. So uh, the balance of probabilities is New Zealand um, should win this game. But um, as I said at the start, um, there's one opponent you don't want to give a sniff to and that's Argentina. If they get any sort of confidence going, they can be really difficult to shake off. And Matt? The other semi-final, South Africa, England. Who would have thought it? England 
in the quarter semi final. <laughs> Six months ago, you had them fully down and out, and rightly so, I suppose, from the performances. But uh, we talk about the South African team, Razia Razabas and Jack Nainabar picking only the second time, you know, the same 23. Hard to believe that. But which way do you see that going? And um, Razi's mind games this week, picking Steve Borthwick's 23 on Tuesday. Up those old tricks again, isn't he? Mate, there's a little there's a little hole drilled through the England training room fence with a South African eye peeking through a training pick of his teams. Razi's a genius, isn't he, with, with how he's conducted himself and he's great humor, you know. I think it's I think it's great what he does. Um and you know they you've got to give the Africans, South Africans a lot of credit. They they you, you know, only saying that you're only saying that now, Matt, because he sent you a personal tweet and showed you some love about your your the seven one split, you know. Well, mate. I want to know if they were direct Rassi, messaging as well. I'll... I give Rassi credit. He's gone back to five three and I told him he should, and he's done it for two yeah. weeks and they've won both he's, games. He's I listening said it was to six back. Well done on the five three, mate. <laughs> so you t- are you taking credit, Matt, or what's going on here? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, R- Rassi's and, and their, their tactics. You know, and look, I don't, I'm not a fan of the crossfield kick. I'm not a fan of it. I, I, I think they've got so much more talent. As I said, three tries, three tries, three passes. You know, um, so it's not something I, 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 I admire. I, let, me, let me put it, I admire it. The intensity that they're playing with is incredible. I, I think there is a question of how many times can you go to the well till you get a dip in performance. Um, and th- th- they are vulnerable. If they were playing a better opponent than England, I think they would be vulnerable. But, you know, England have um, struggled in every match, pretty much, every single match. But, again, because of the draw and their side of the pool has been significantly um, weaker than South Africa, Ireland, New Zealand and France's side of the pool, they had a pretty pretty good path. To to a uh, to a uh, semi, you know, we we could all see that 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 side of the pool. You could put in a couple of wins. You got a pretty straightforward path to a semi. Now the now the rubber hits the road. Every on every metric, England are going uh, are going to lose this game on every single metric. Uh, even even just on entertainment value, South Africa are far more entertaining than England. Wow, you know that's telling you something. England's attack has just been diabolical on this in this uh, World Cup. But they've made a semi-final, so they'll say the English people say, "What do they care?" And they've got a shot. Of course, they've got a shot. Uh, the semi-finals, the history of our semi of World Cup semi-finals is they throw up great games, and three of the greatest games I've ever seen, apart from last week again, were were semi-finals: uh, France versus Australia '87, New Zealand versus France '99, and England versus New Zealand '19. Semi-finals have are the three greatest games I, I, I've witnessed up to last weekend. They have another thing in common, that the underdog wins in those three games. Now, the the gap between South Africa and England, the only time it's been that big was France versus New, a, a Jonah Lomo-driven New Zealand in 1999 at Twickenham. And, and New Zealand put on three tries in the first half. It's game over, all over Red Rover. Let's go home. France came out in the second half and won the match. The question is... Do this England side have the firepower to do that to South Africa? You just can't see it on in any way. It is a replay of the last final of the 2019 World Cup final. And, and really interestingly, I think Borthwick has put this to his players is we never thought we'd get the chance for revenge. Here's a chance at redemption. Here's a chance to redeem yourself. And then the most, the most uh, striking piece of evidence for that is he selected Dan Cole in the front row at tight head prop. And, and I, 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 I really feel for players that, that make errors in big games because it stays with them for the rest of their life. And Dan had a really, really poor game, uh, a scrummaging game in that uh, final and, and was, was really dished up. He selected. Here is your shot at redemption. And that's what he's saying to that team. We got a shot at putting this right. Let's out you go. And you know, sometimes that's all that, that's one of the most motivating factors for an athlete. You know, they're 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 so competitive and so driven 
and and that that the loser World Cup final would burn and burns and burns, and you do carry it. You just learn to live with it. You carry it for the rest of your life. You just learn to live with it. Here's your shot to get it back. Now, is that enough motivation? You've got to say it's that it, if you've got any money, it's a New Zealand South Africa final next week. But the semi-finals have proved in the past. You cannot always say that. You cannot always say that. So it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting. England will have to fire a lot of shots, miss every, uh, kick every single goal, miss none. But what they can't do is what France and Ireland did, is give their opposition soft points. They're going to have to earn them. I, 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 I can't see it happening. I, I can't see anything but New Zealand and South Africa. But the semi-finals of World Cups has taught me to respect the semi-final process that it is possible. Alan, what about that for a quote from Matt Williams? England attack is diabolical. <laughs> well, it's, no, and it's, before you answer that, I want to know if England are to beat South Africa. Long shot, yes, but how do they do it? Um, I don't know. I don't <laughs> Come on, know. Pretty. I think they, they, oh, they do. It, I'm listening. They, I want to hear it. They do it by um, obviously if they create a chance or an opportunity that they score. If they get into South Africa's 22, that they capitalise, either kick a penalty or maybe get a mall try. If I'm England and uh, I, 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 you said to me, put a plan in place to beat South Africa, I'd say be a little bit braver. Um, get the ball in Manu Tuilangi's hands as often as you can because he's going to give you a bit of a focal point. Try and get Ben Earl on the ball. Um, he's obviously picked... Um, made some changes and brought in George Martin because he's a bit more physical maybe and aggressive than than Chesham. There's a risk in that then that your line-out isn't as good. Chesham is a very good line-out operator. But, um, you know, if you go through this English team, Stuart, there, there's some really good players there, really good players. I think the problem is the style that England have played with and the lack of inventiveness. Um, Big game players as well. Big game players. Yes, yeah. So, like, there's, there's... I guarantee you they they really fancy their chances of upsetting the odds and physically they're a big side England so if they man up physically and kind of stop South Africa's dominance there well who knows they may get a couple of penalties get the scoreboard taken over um and and that's their chance that's their you know like if you look at their wingers Daly and uh, and and Johnny May there's pace there Freddie Stewart at full back he's a good player I would, I would have been brave here with Bortrick. I would have went with Arundel. I would have put him straight in at full back and said, you know what, I get, or get him on the wing. He, it's a shame that this, we haven't seen this guy throughout the World Something's Cup. Something's not right there, Alan. He hasn't made a yeah, stay he's a, squad he's a, he's since a, that Chile game talent. where he scored five tries or something, didn't he? He's a special talent. But look, um, that's their chance. They, they, they kind of man up and uh, get their set piece right and, and keep control of the game. I think they will kick a lot, and uh, they're not going. They're not going to change now, and start running the ball around. So, when you have that kind of sort of a limited game plan, it can work sometimes. And if they get really up for this game, um, and get really pumped, and get in among South Africa, they could unsettle them again. You know, they're they're six day turnaround, or incredible fatigue and pressure from last weekend. So that's where both Argentina and England will have to talk about and try and bring a real kind of tempo themselves to the game. But that's their chance. You know, they're not going to cut South Africa open. Um, they may get a sniff or two here and there. Somebody may miss a tackle. Take your chance. And I tell you, if England can get on the scoreboard and get it moving a little bit with a few penalties, then the longer the game goes on, the more nervy the opposi- opposition can become. But I, I just think South Africa are too good. I think their mentality is so strong, and they don't. Um, they they're just very composed sides. But both Brassi Erasmus and Ian Foster will know, um, and you can't always control that. If they're not on the money tonight, the both Argentina and England can make it difficult for both those sides. And sport is crazy sometimes. So on paper, it's a New Zealand South Africa final. There you go, on paper, New Zealand-South Africa final. I was going to ask for your predictions, but would you agree with that, Matt? You, you, on all the evidence, Stu, you, you've, you've got to say exactly New Zealand-South Africa. Again, it's the emotions. Can can these teams emotionally recover? That's And Quinny's touched on it, and he's right. 
but then the opposition's got to be good enough to capitalise on the on South Africa and New Zealand having spent so much energy last round in the in the quarters that they won't be at their best. And I don't think they will be. I just don't. We've got no evidence that the opposition will be better. The only plus for both Argentina and England is that they have a lot more energy in the tank because they've come through a lot easier road to, to this semi-final than their opposition. Having said all that, you still can't see them winning. It's got it's got to be. And I, I don't know the, the South is crowing. Uh, three three of the uh, semi finalists from the South from the championship, uh, and a lot of people saying that you know it's it's showing the quality in the championship. You know that that's that's the way it goes. But if it's if an inch the other way, then then you got Ireland and France in, and they're out. So it, it's still going. The, the the one thing with the Argentinians, they're so used to playing New Zealand. They play them you know every year, twice a year. So that's the one I think where the, the upset might come more than more than the South Africans. Well, we will see. All them up. Thanks as always as ever. What a weekend of rugby ahead of us. Don't forget to tune in on Virgin Media 1 Saturday night at 7 o'clock for the second semi-final as South Africa take on England. Thanks for listening.